Rush hour in Berlin. This is the reality of living in a city. Traffic congestion often leads to wasted time and high frustrations. But there are potential solutions to this problem. Flying cars. Termite ant highways. Memo delivery tubes for smiling people. And 50 minute rocket trips around the world. But all these concepts still feel a bit far away. I want to see what mobility solutions are just around the corner. How will we move around the city of the future? To find out that, we'll be taking you from Berlin to the Netherlands. There we'll take a look at something that could reduce the time that you spend in traffic. And after that, we're going to take a sneak peek at a prototype that might change the way how we move around the city of the future. But wait a minute, how do we actually move around cities today? In Berlin, public transportation is good, but not nearly good enough to get cars off the street. Car sharing, renting a car on the side of the road for a short amount of time, is already an option that in theory reduces the need for people to have a car. But often these services are just offered in the city center. This means that people in suburbs and rural areas are stranded without their own car. Even in a big city like Berlin, this problem exists. I just missed the night bus and have to wait another 30 minutes to get to the train station. In that time I could just walk, but it's cold and tedious. This problem has a name. It's the so-called first and last mile gap. Often the distance from your front door to the next train station is the most critical. It's this gap that the smart city of the future will need to close. My hands are freezing, so while I wait here on the bus, I want to show you what I saw at a mobility exhibition last year. One of the major topics of this year's Green Tech Festival was mobility, but I was actually quite disappointed that most of the concepts and things shown here were classical cars. Sure, they were green cars, they were uh, battery cars, hydrogen powered cars, but I didn't really see anything new. And that was a bit disappointing. Remember me, waiting at the bus stop? I still have 25 minutes left. Well, this thing might just be the solution to all my problems. The Easy Mile is an autonomous, on-demand minibus shuttle. That means no more waiting to get to the train station. My name is Franka Trippler. I'm part of the Easy Mile communications team. Our shuttle solved this first last mile transportation gap to make it more accessible. Also, when it comes to like social inclusion, like elderly or people that with reduced mobility. And this could help people yeah, to get faster to so-called mobility hubs such as train stations or so on if we close this gap. In the future you will be able to order this bus over an app. Because it drives autonomously it can pick you up at any time of the day or the night right from your doorstep. It then drives you to the next train station so you can seamlessly move from one mode of transport to the next without needing a car. I believe that we can reduce car ownership drastically and at the same time improving the environment. So what does that mean? Is the private car dead? Well, not really. We're going to the Netherlands to find out exactly that because the Netherlands wants to become the front-runner in smart mobility. Free 
Amsterdam is already considered the world capital of cycling. 63% of its inhabitants use their bikes on a daily basis, according to Amsterdam City Council. But that doesn't mean the Dutch don't have their fair share of car problems too. Running, running, running. This is Stefan van Dijk. He's head of innovation at the AMS, which stands for Amsterdam Institute for Advanced Metropolitan Solutions. Where do you see the biggest problems with the way we move around as people in cities today? Yeah. So if you look at the, the cities that we now live in and also uh, Amsterdam in, in particular, uh, we are still addicted to, uh, to vehicles and, uh, and combustion engine uh, vehicles. Everywhere in the world, especially in cities, people are driving from A to B. So what we still see is a lot of uh, noise pollution, air pollution, greenhouse gas emissions and traffic jams. And in the end, if you think about it, all around the world congestion is often caused by bad traffic management. Is that camera recording? Is there a red light blinking? Meet Boris Koch. He's in charge of testing smart traffic lights for the district of North Holland. Traffic lights that can talk to cars. Part, part of smart mobility is that we digitize uh, the infrastructure and we connect everything to each other. To show how the system works, could you kind of talk us through it? Yeah, what we have here, what we're experimenting with are the intelligent traffic lights. We estimate that you can get around 15% increase of efficiency in traveling uh, across an intersection. To make the flow of traffic more efficient, one idea is to link groups of vehicles together into platoons. They form a platoon by communicating and they also uh, communicate to the traffic light that the platoon is approaching. And then you can have multiple trucks uh, cross through a green light, which saves a lot of fuel. Because a big truck stopping and starting again could cost one liter of diesel. So what you see here is a 5G communication modem which sends out information about the traffic lights, about the colors and the predictions. And with that, the cars can adjust their speed. This modem has a range of 200, 500 meters. And over that range, it shares information about the light, the cues, and uh, the time at which the traffic light will change. And then the car can adjust the speed accordingly. Intelligent traffic lights can prioritize certain vehicles. In this case, making a bus journey more enjoyable. But the main purpose of smart infrastructure is to make the flow of traffic more efficient on the whole. Yeah, so for example, if a car is a kilometer away and it knows that the light is going to change uh, to green at a certain time, it can calculate its approach speed and make sure that when it arrives at the crossing, it gets a green light. While Boris Koch is developing the traffic management system of the future, the AMS is bringing an old concept back from the grave to make it fit for the 21st century. Yeah, uh, you looking at a time bomb. Short fuse, no use when the sight's on. <laughs> Straight like a python. Go cool, no losing when I'm on. What will mobility look like in the smart city of the future? Yeah. So actually this is quite an interesting question and of course uh, if you look at the mobility developments and where, where we should go, it's still something that is always very hard to predict. But we can design and uh, think about the, the uh, future vision for a city where we really would like to live in. And this combination of uh, mobility solutions that are easily accessible is probably the best way forward. So we need new concepts and new ideas and one of these new concepts is robot. Yeah. What is robot? Yeah, so um, if you look at mobility and transportation in, uh, in older cities, and especially here in Amsterdam, uh, we started developing a concept which is called Rowboat, uh, which actually is uh, a very old concept. It's moving uh, goods and people uh, to their destination over the water, making use of the canals and the waterways in the, in the urban area. Um, okay, but why autonomous boats though? Yeah. You know, like yeah. We have autonomous cars coming yeah. soon. I, yeah. Elon Musk says maybe in two years or something. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so <laughs> Uh, so, so the, the whole concept of uh, of rowboat, of course, it's part, it's an autonomous system. We were 
thinking about how can we revitalize the old infrastructure of, of Amsterdam and also in other cities that have waterways, uh, but try to work on a uh, system that is, can be operated 24-7 hours a day, so also in the night. And, and why? Uh, because uh, a lot of the logistic services, if you would move them to uh, uh, the night, uh, the night time, uh, you can have much more operation and uh, much more efficiency. What role does digitization play? Uh, of course, artificial intelligence plays a, the most important role in this system. So it's being used to uh, really uh, identify the objects on the water yeah. and also to uh, learn while the system is operating on the, uh, on the canals uh, to improve itself and also uh, improve the, um, uh, let's say, the actions and the, um, the routes it, it takes. So over there in the garage, the rowboat prototype is being constructed right now. Hi, I'm Rens. Um, I work at AMS Institute and I'm working here as an engineer. What makes this boat smart? Well, uh, that's, that's the whole thing about this boat. It, it will have uh, intelligence on board to make sure that it uses all the data from the sensors. So the things that it sees in the area, uh, that it knows about its current position, to actually navigate in a safe way around the city. Uh, the one that's most obvious is the LiDAR. It uses laser to look around, so basically it makes a scan of the area. But it also has cameras, so these cameras are used um, well to also get a, an image of what is going on in the water. In addition to that, we also have a GPS and an IMU, which is basically uh, something that, that acts as a compass. But around the boat we also have some sensors, so... Um, but they're not there yet, because this is a prototype, right? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. We'll, we'll start to integrate them during the year, and we'll make sure that they work. Uh, one of the important ones, for example, is uh, additional cameras around, yeah. to make sure that if there are multiple boats, and we want to connect them together, they can actually see where that boat is, yeah. and how we should move. Yeah. If the boat is in the water, uh, we need to have an idea of how it is mm -hmm. uh, behaving. And then there's also pressure sensors that, that uh, see the, the water level. And uh, using all that information together, we can, uh, well, navigate through the water. So you're looking at the base, yeah. so the, the platform that uh, has most of the hardware in it, and, and the top, which can be changed for uh, the use cases that we have. Yeah. So for example, now it is a use case for, well, transporting people around the city, so people can sit inside, uh, have a nice view. Uh, but we can change that and, for example, make it into a, a garbage mu module, transport goods, any other thing that would be helpful in the city. It's an electric boat, right? But how do you charge it? On this bumper on the outside, there will be a plate. Yeah. And when it comes close enough to another plate, it will start charging. So it's like a wireless system that, uh, well, we don't need to plug anything in. This is the battery, I assume? Yes, yes, this is actually a very interesting look inside the boat. Uh, the, the, the big one in the middle is, of course, the, the battery. Yeah. And then on the, the side here, you can see uh, the motor that, that powers the... The, the thrusters, the, right? Yes, Okay. the bow thrusters that make the, the boat go sideways. Yeah. Uh, on the side here, uh, the, the, the power distribution, yeah. so uh, the cables, but also the, the electronics that make sure that the, the power goes wherever it needs to go. Yeah. And then uh, on the side here below, we will have uh, the, the computer mm -hmm. that uh, operates most of the, the hardware. Why is this not just an Amsterdam solution? Yeah. Or so, is it only an Amsterdam solution? Um, of course, it's really started with the context of Amsterdam, which has this massive amount of urban waterways in this very dense network. If you look at the Netherlands, a lot of these older cities have a similar infrastructure. We have Rotterdam, we have Utrecht, we have Gouda and Groningen. A lot of cities have the same kind of infrastructure with waterways. But if you take it even a step uh, further, um, we get interests from Stockholm and from London and from Paris and from Singapore that all have waterways that are not being used for moving goods around or very limited way. So all cities that are based in delta areas or have rich waterways can make use of this kind of solutions. I think that the things that we saw in this episode really sound exciting, but there is one thing we need to talk about. The implementation of new mobility systems always takes time. There's many legal questions that need to be addressed 
For instance, in the case of an accident, who's responsible? Until we can answer questions like this, legislation will remain one of the limiting factors for autonomous vehicles. Because traffic on land is so much more complex than on the water, some experts say we may need quantum computing before autonomous cars can become a reality. And that could take time. But on water, it's a different story. Because there's a lot less going on, the AMS predicts that we could see autonomous boats like the rowboat become a thing in the next three to five years. That's it for this video. I hope you liked it. If you did, you might as well give us a thumbs up since you've stuck around so long anyway. Activate that notification bell and subscribe to our YouTube channel, DW Shift. That's it from me. See you in the next one.